Okay, so thank you very much, Professor. Um, we'd like to look at managing the care of patients with bisphosphonates and other anti-resorptive therapies. Now, our main problem is that we've got an ageing population. We're going to see more and more of these patients and more patients are going to be on these medications because although it is a medication that they have to take, the impact that it has on the general health of the population, on the cost of healthcare, is quite tremendous. If you look at what it costs to do one hip replacement in a patient who fractured their hip, not only the cost to the hospital system, but the cost to that person and that individual, it is enormous versus the cost of taking a tablet once a, a week or having subcutaneous injections once every six months, it is actually quite an impact. And it is a game changer, um, these drugs, when we look at it from managing osteoporosis. Also for cancer patients, if you speak to cancer patient and they say how much bone pain they had before they started their, bone, their treatment with Zometa, for instance, a patient would say they couldn't get out of bed, they were in intractable bone pain. They had one infusion of Zometa and they could get out of bed and the quality of life that that drug has given them is really beneficial. So stopping the drugs and lessening the impact is not an option. As dental professionals, what we need to do is we need to deal with it. We need to deal with the problem, the drugs aren't going away and we need to find a way to do this. Now, a lot of this at the moment is being done in specialist clinics. We don't have the resources to do this in specialist clinics. We need to have more done at the primary healthcare level by our regional clinics, by our general dentists. Now, I think this is a very interesting quote and I never truly understood this quote coming from an Afrikaans background um, until we discussed it and we looked at ONJ because we've had so many terms. There's osteonecrosis, there's bronze, there's emronge, there's deronge, there's aronge. What do we call it? Well, it doesn't really matter because it's the same thing. Like Shakespeare said, it's still a rose. And the one we're using at the moment is emronge because it kind of encapsulates and has an umbrella over all drugs. So we prefer that one, but we all know what we're talking about when we talk about it. So Prof Ebling has gone, gone through the definition but even with the definition, there's a bit of ambiguity because the definition says it's exposed bone or bone that can be uh, curatized through a tract or a fistula. But when we look at the staging, stage zero, there is no fistula, there is no tract. Okay, and then obviously, very important, no history of radiation. We see it more in the mandible, we know this. Um, we see it more in females, maybe because females uh, have more, a high incidence of osteoporosis. And then we see it more in patients who have other comorbidities. Now, the good thing to note is that alcohol, for some reason, doesn't have a high increase. So stop smoking, but continue drinking. No, I didn't say that. Um, OK, and then the incidence. So this is another area of contention where I think we might tend to differ from our endocrinology colleagues. We think the incidence is quite higher quite than what is reported in the literature in general. Now, a study that was done um, by Mina and Michael, I think was a co-author on that, showed what we agree with, that um, about one in 28 patients, one in 30 patients, roughly, so 3.46%, do present with this um, condition. When we read the literature in general, some studies say it's really, really low in the 0, 0.0 range. Now. We don't agree with this because we've got patients coming in and they state that their endocrinologist told them the risk was negligible and they now want all on four implants and they want major reconstructions done and we say, whoa, no, we're not going there. The risk is too high and they get very upset because their endocrinologist told them the risk was 0.01%. And that's another area of contention that we have to deal with at present. Uh, parenterals, so our IV and our subcutaneous roots, our risk is higher, and especially for our Zometa patients. It might be because Zometa also has anti-angiogenic effects. We're not sure why. Denosumab has less and, or has no anti-angiogenic effect. Maybe that's why denosumab has a slightly lower rate of emronge forming. Um, but when we do see emronge in denosumab patients, incidentally, we think it's worse than what we'd see it with Zometa patients but there's so much that's up in the air with this. Now, statistics, like I just said, there's very up in the air, 
And Benjamin Disraeli said there were lies, damn lies, and statistics. And that's how we feel about Emrange, because we don't know where we are. We don't know what number or not what value to put on it. And as with science, everything changes, because recently we found out Benjamin Disraeli didn't even make that saying. It was actually a gentleman called Sir Charles Wentworth Dilke. So as science and as history progressive, progresses, we realize everything changes and what we know today will be different tomorrow. But all we can do is go by what we know today. There's uncertainty about any, everything in this field, the pathophysiology, the treatment, the long-term outcome. Now, we know there's no real treatment that benefits everyone. We have a lot of things that we can do. Some of it benefits some patients, some of it doesn't benefit the patient. We kind of throw things at it that we think is going to help and if it doesn't work we try something else. Um, certain things we know work, certain things we have some evidence for but we've got no great evidence for everything, for anything that works absolutely. Um, the biggest thing is prevention in our mind. Now the dental practitioner prior to any patient starting bisphosphonate therapy, it's very important to do a very thorough screening of the patient to get any disease process under control, be it caries, periodontal disease, and taking quite a hard line on teeth that we think are going to fail in future. Um, doing the root canal treatment, getting the periodontal titus under control, but very important never to advise a patient against taking it. I think that links in with Prof Ebeling's statement where when there are reports or when we do say, oh, you shouldn't be on this, that's not a good thing to say. We are not trained to say that. We have to manage it. Okay. General practitioner, very important. A lot of our GPs actually think the risk is really low. And we should, when we speak to our colleagues, say, please send all your patients for assessment prior to starting them on any bone modifying agent. And it's important that the GPs know this because GPs that I've spoken to, a lot of them are not really concerned and they're not informed. They don't know about the risk. Um, the other thing that came out of um, the group in Adelaide is to when you discuss a high-risk patient with their GP, and Prof Ebeling will be able to advise us better on this, but there's evidence showing that Fosamax doesn't really have a very big influence if it's taken for longer than five years. So maybe it's not necessary to have patients on Fosamax for longer than five years. That's not a call we can make though. That's something that we can discuss with a patient's general practitioner to consider. Um, if a patient's on current bisphosphonates, obviously we want to do everything we can to prevent an extraction or any surgical intervention. Um, so even root treating, decoronating the tooth and burying the root. That's a very good option if it's a viable option for the patient. If there's perio associated with that tooth or a periapical lesion, obviously it's not an option. And if we do end up at extraction, we've got guidelines that we would like you to follow with that. But very important, practice-driven follow-up every six months. We should be making sure that we're seeing these patients. If they fail to attend their appointments, we should get on to them. And if you're in private practice or in a government clinic, it's important that we should drive that follow-up because we know these patients are at risk and the limited cost that it takes to follow up the patient to get them in far, is far less than what it costs to actually treat these patients. You happy if I take that? Yes, one? please. Now, may I have that from oh, your yes. um, blouse? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'll Thank you. this onto myself. So, my name's Owen. Um, what I want to talk about is, um, as a den dental practitioner, how you manage a patient taking one of these medications. So, for an example, Trista in the top back is, has a patient coming in who's been on bisphosphonates. And she goes, crumbs, what do I do? I want to prevent this patient getting Emronge. It's a terrible disease. I'll have to see them constantly if they get it. So Trista goes to the um, dental hospital intranet, looks up the guidelines and sees nothing, absolutely nothing. There are no guidelines for this hospital at the moment. I think there were some in the past, but there's none available at the moment. Yes, we're under review. Under review. So then Trista goes, what do I do now? We have no hospital guidelines. I'll look up Victoria Health guidelines. And Trista searches and searches and she finds no guidelines whatsoever. So Trista is left without anything to guide her. Um, 
Trista then looks at all health networks in Australia and finds the only guideline in Australia published is the 2009 New South Wales Health Guideline. It's a very long dossier and it's very complicated and it's very hard for clinicians to use. So what I want to talk about is what evidence we have at the moment to guide us as dental practitioners on what we can do to prevent um, a patient developing Emronge. So there are three possible options that come from the literature that we could consider to use to prevent getting Emronge. One is a drug holiday, one is the use of antibiotics, and one is the use of CTX, a taking a blood test. So, <clears throat> We look at the most recent guidelines, and Prof has already highlighted these to us. So the um, American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeon position paper in 2014. Um, and there is also an international consensus from last year published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research. So those are the two most current guidelines I can find to guide us. So, in these three areas, CTX. So we did use this in the past, and if there is a value of less than 150, that may be indicative that bone turnover is reduced and the patient is at a higher risk of developing Emronge. But um, what the international consensus on the position paper is saying is that it doesn't give any extra benefit to Trista to help her decide how to manage her patient taking one of these medications. So currently on these guidelines, CTX isn't found to be helpful. Now the next one, antibiotics. So this is an area that is contentious in the literature. There is a belief that the uh, microbes play a role in the atopathogenesis of Emronge, um, but no one has come to a specific consensus that yes, there's strong evidence for it. It is suggested in the literature that it may reduce the risk of giving infection. Then the next point to talk about is a drug holiday. Once again, there's very limited evidence to support the use of a drug holiday. Um, and I think what we're using is Dam and Jones' um, research from a few years ago saying that it may offer a theoretical benefit um, in preventing Emron. So the position papers from a few years ago, 2009 position paper and the Australian Dental Asso uh, American Dental Association paper in 2009 were suggesting a two or three uh, if a patient was on a bisphosphonate for two or three years, then you may consider a drug holiday. The current papers are suggesting four years. So if a patient has been on a, um, one of these medications for four years, you may consider using a drug holiday. So these are, the, these are our three areas that we could consider using. So I've, I've ruled out CTX. And there is some suggestion for antibiotics and some suggestion for drug holiday. What that means is there is very limited evidence to support any of these. These are expert opinions with current evidence at the moment, but the evidence is limited. So that means that we may use antibiotics and we may use a drug holiday, but that doesn't give us a shield to say we're not going to develop Emronge. So we... Um, so... Dr. Hutchinson, Dr. Engelbrecht and myself have worked on a small protocol here. And as I've said, it doesn't, it's not going to be a golden shield to prevent getting Emronge. But I think it's a simplification of this complicated issue for the general dental community. So in this prevention protocol, we've stated what Emron is, as we've been through the definition before at the top, so exposed bone for more than eight weeks. We've listed all of the medications that could potentially be involved in this problem. So IV bisphosphonates, oral bisphosphonates, rank L ligand inhibitors, and antiogenic medications. So our, um, all up there, thank you very much, Hanley.
So our questionnaire at the beginning sort of highlighted the fact that people weren't familiar what medications could cause hemorrhage. We've listed all of the common ones. And then we've divided, um, thank you for continued highlight, we've divided the patients into low risk and high risk categories. So low risk patients taking a single um, oral bisphosphonates for less than four years with no other issues going on. There is no um, evidence at the moment that we should delay or do anything differently for this patient. Then we've divided patients into high risk. So if they're on an oral medication for four more, four more years, if they're on an oral bisphosphonate and taking an oral corticosteroid, um, or um, IB bisphosphonates, we would consider using um, a three-month preoperative uh, uh, holiday and consider using antibiotics as well. Most importantly, consulting the practicing, f the treating physician before stopping bisphosphonates. Um, then we have a day of surgical protocol, which I'll go through, and obviously in the purple box, if there's any complications, so if the patient has developed Enronch, as we've stated up before, then uh, refer to oral surgery. Great. Um, so we'll move on now. So I've talked about the medications and the day of surgery protocol. So getting consent, explaining to the patient that, sorry, it, it's too loud or too, pin it, okay, I'll pin it. Explaining to the patient that they may develop Enron despite our best efforts. Um, giving, so if this is our day of surgery protocol, if they're at risk, so giving them antibiotics Chlorhexidine mouthwash, avoiding using local anaesthetic locally, trying to use blocks where possible, trying to use the extraction in an atraumatic technique, avoid using dressings like Surgicel or Alvadul, um, <coughs> and trying to get primary closure where possible, and then giving the patient um, antibiotics to take home, and reviewing the patient at two and eight weeks. So obviously at eight weeks, because if they haven't developed a communication by eight weeks, they don't have Enronge. Staging, so once again, Prof has gone through this, so I'll be very quick. Um, if um, Enronge were developed, we can stage it, and this is therefore determines how we can treat it. So stage one, no evidence of necrotic bone. Sorry, stage zero. Stage one, exposed bone, um, but asymptomatic. Ex Stage two, exposed bone with symptoms. Stage three, exposed bone with symptoms and one of the other following, pathological fracture, extra oral fistula and or osteolysis extending to the inferior border. And then determining on the stage of Enron, this determines how we can treat that patient. So if there's stage one, chlorhexidine and education about what the problem is. Stage two, chlorhexidine and antibiotics and considering superficial debridement. Stage three is a bit more extensive in how we would treat them. Um, do you want to take over? So just to get back to the treatment, would you stage like one, microphone? we think the general dentist or the senior dentist in the practice should be able to manage. That's starting the patient on chlorhexidine rinses, getting the patient to gently brush the exposed bone. Getting all these patients to be seen at a specialist clinic is very cumbersome and really creates a bottleneck for the specialist clinics. Um, possibly, general dentists can start treating stage two patients. That's if the dentist is confident to perhaps very atraumatically reduced, reduce exposed bone, necrotic bone, that's standing there really harboring bacteria. Um, it's causing an impediment physically for the patient. The patient might say the tongue is scraping on the sharp bony edges and you can take a ronger and gently nibble down the bone, gently smoothen it down with very limited surgical access. Um, this depends on the surgeon's or the dentist's confidence to manage that. Usually this would be a senior dentist in the clinic. Um, but obviously when we get to stage two or stage three, that's when that warrants a referral. Now the outcomes, <coughs> We generally get 
good outcomes if we manage these patients based on our guidelines, based, based on the staging, but some patients will not respond and some patients will regress and get worse. These are usually our cancer patients. We recently had a patient at Peter Mac who had 77 doses of Zometa. When I took out a tooth that was abscessed, the bone was brown underneath. So he had it, there's no way, like there's no way to get around that. So some patients are unfortunately just more at risk. They've had such a high exposure. There is nothing we can do. But the patients that we see generally, we should be able to offer them something and we should be able to get a response from them. Now, in conclusion, we're not there yet by no means. Nothing of this has really enlightened you and made you go, aha, that's how I'm going to treat it. But what we want you to know is that in spite of a lot of the uncertainty and in spite of the fact that there are no set guidelines that we can say you have to do this, we can say what we suggest you do. If you follow our protocols that we suggest you do by giving the patient the prophylactic antibiotic an hour beforehand, by following the chlorhexidine mouth rinse, by doing the extraction yourself if you can do it atraumatically and only referring if you cannot do it atraumatically, and we all follow the same guideline, we will be able to see if we are getting somewhere. If we all go off and we do our own thing and say, antibiotics don't work, so I'm just not going to use it, there's not really much evidence for that. But we all use the same guideline and we will learn from that and collectively, hopefully, we'll get some data from that. It's a very interesting topic. Watch the space and we'll see where we go from here. Okay, thank you. And now the questions. So if Prof Ebling would like to join us in front and if there's any questions from anyone. Yes. What about those patients that have been on these medications and they've stopped them? How long after do we still do that protocol? Like, um, because the medication still stays in the in body for... So what I would suggest is that you still do that protocol and you still warn the patient. Um, because the medication, especially the oral bisphosphonates, they bind to the bone and they're there for 10 years. So I would still warn the patients. Usually the patients, as they age, they have more and more comorbidities as they get along. So now they might be dealing with diabetes in addition to the osteoporosis that they had. So I would suggest that you still go along with that protocol. Could I come and ask yes. Good. Yeah. yeah, so th that's an interesting question. I think it's important to remember that all the anti-resorptive drugs are not the same. So denosumab is completely reversible. So it'll, uh, its effects on reducing bone remodeling will be uh, lost after six months if another injection is not given. And if you look at the treatment studies, if you treat somebody for two years, you know, with four injections of denosumab and then look at their bone density, it goes up quite a lot, can go up by about 10% in two years. But if you stop the treatment, it will go down back to baseline in one year. So as soon as you stop treating with denosumab, you'll lose the benefit on bone. So that's important to know. So it makes sense to me if you needed a dental procedure, if you're on denosumab for osteoporosis anyway, to plan that for the end of the six-month period. Um, maybe you could delay you know, the next injection for two or four weeks and, and do it then, because the bone remodeling will be bouncing back up at that stage. And the other thing is the bisphosphonates are not all the same either. So residronate has a shorter skeletal half-life than alendronate or zoledronic acid. So residronate is called actinol, um, and that skeletal half-life is about three or four months. So um, maybe having a drug holiday for residronate makes sense, but it, I'm afraid it doesn't make sense for alendronate where its skeletal half-life is 10 years uh, and zoledronic acid is probably for a lifetime. So um, we know that giving one infusion of zoledronic acid will reduce bone uh, remodeling for at least five years based on bone turnover markers. So if you measure with CTX within five years, it'll be below 150 after one infusion of zoledronic acid. So that's why CTX isn't really helpful. It doesn't differentiate enough uh, between uh, your risk of getting ONG, ONJ or not, and that's why it hasn't been used. And that's why the concept of a drug holiday, it's appealing because it makes us feel like we're doing something. But if we think about the action of uh, alendronate and zoledronic acid in particular, uh, it's not likely to have much of an effect. Yes, there was another question. Are you, um, are you saying that there should be antibiotic prophylaxis for low risk cases as well? Yes. Yes, we suggest that. 
suggest that as a routine because we're trying to simplify things and we're trying to take all the guesswork out of it for patients. If we give, we've seen ONJ in patients who've been on Fosamax for six months, unfortunately. No comorbidity is the only etiological factor, factor possible is the Fosamax. So as a standard, we say we're using that protocol. For them, we will not necessarily give post-operative antibiotics, but definitely the single dose beforehand because we know that gets rid of the usual bacteria. And the aim is not to prevent the ONJ, the aim is to prevent the surgical site infection that could lead to that or propagate that. Yes. Um, I don't know if I saw it incorrectly, but when Alan presented stage one, two, and three, um, he was talking about you, you said the symptoms of stage one and two, but then you knew you had your one, two, and three out, you had what you said antibiotics for stage two. Was that? If there is an active infection, so if in stage two we've got pus draining and an active infection, then we use the antibiotics. And the second part of my question is, if you look through therapy guidelines, it doesn't say, it says about absolutely using prophylactic antibiotics, you know, to get the high, highest level of time of incision, but it doesn't say anything about another continuing course of action. No, it doesn't. And that's the problem that we have, that we don't have a specific guideline and that's what we're working on. And we had a, a policy in the hospital that got taken down because it's up for review, that we're busy reviewing. And it's just watching the space till we have a guideline. We don't know. We don't know what's the best way to go ahead. But what we postulate is if there are comorbidities, we need to deal with them. If a patient is a diabetic and we're doing an extraction, we would either way cover them with post-operative antibiotics. And a lot of these patients have comorbidities, so we do the prophylactic pre-operative dose of antibiotics. Um, we do a single dose. In New South Wales, there are certain clinics that do a whole course of antibiotics beforehand before they do the extraction. Now, we also need to consider that on the one hand, we need to think of preventing infection, but on the other hand, we need to think of antibiotic and resistance. So you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. We don't know what the best way is, but for us, the single dose makes just as much sense as giving a whole course. Yeah. It's difficult. I can shrug my shoulders. Yeah, like mm. the whole mm. Yes, exactly. We're trying not to overuse, but this is an at-risk population, and this is the population where we need it in. I don't know if you have an opinion. No, that's fine. Yeah. Trista, who, who is Trista? Trista is very inquisitive. <coughs> She's also a registered dentist with the, um, with the Dental Board of Australia, mm -hmm. and she would know their heart therapy guidelines. Uh, she <laughs> wouldn't be going back to New South Wales and going back to the guidelines. She'd be using the oral and dental therapeutic guidelines which were published in 2012. Mm -hmm. And that whole discussion about um, antibiotic, antibiotics and the potential of developing antibiotic resistance is something we need to really take into consideration if you're recommending to, to everybody who's on bisphosphonates to have antibiotic prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. It's not the right thing to do. Um, because you, you'll be putting people at risk of adverse events for the antibiotics that they're taking and they're developing the future development of um, antibiotic resistance. For, uh, and the risks for that are probably going to outweigh the benefit that you potentially might get for developing a, a, a condition that is not an infection in the first place. I yes. think this highlights yeah. the issue that there are lots of expert opinions and different opinions on it. Yeah, so there is area. one published guideline at the moment, and I think if you're going to think about reviewing that then and making Dental Health Services Victoria completely different from every other guidelines across Australia, you should have some evidence to show that the patients that are treated by Dental Health Services Victoria are different than the rest of Australians. They're not. We know they're not. What we're finding in our clinic is that the patients that we treat under these protocols, under this guideline, presents with less. Publish we need to publish it. Publish it the patients that we get right. presenting to us with established ONJ are patients who had no guideline followed. Now, it's very difficult to say whether that was the fact that they didn't do a chlorhexidine mouth rinse prior to the surgery, whether they didn't give antibiotic or whether it was the, the practitioner's experience in, at the time of the extraction, whether the extraction was traumatic or not, whether there was primary closure or not. It's very difficult to say. Um, 
but the ones we're seeing that we're following the protocol, that's not happening with. So similarly, in the published literature from the surgery perspective, if you look at oral surgery or maxillofacial and oral surgery papers published, the ones that don't develop the ONJ are the ones that have had the antibiotic prophylaxis, the atraumatic surgery, primary closure, and those rates are very, very low versus presenting patients to clinics that present with established ONJ coming from an external provider who were uncertain about the treatment that they got. So I think we're using that, and that's why it's up for review, and that's why it's up for debate. 